funding in order to figure out how to allocate what you're asking for. Um, and now that we're past that point, yeah, now, now you do see, okay, well, what seems to be non-negotiable, you know, on both sides, and, and, and look, whatever we end up with, uh, presuming that this is settled, the, the, the pay scale that, that we end up with is not gonna be any different than the other two on-campus unions that have settled long ago. I mean, we, it's not as if we spent 15 months arguing for, you know, three percentage points more than, than other employees on campus got. I, I guarantee you, you're, you're not gonna see daylight there. So clearly we're fighting over things that, some of them do have financial implications, healthcare, retiree benefits and whatnot, but, but some of them don't, or, or have such minuscule financial implications that it's almost embarrassing that, that we're still discussing them. Um, retiree benefits for domestic partners. The impact of the bottom line for the state is vanishingly small there. Uh, yet that, that's, that's treated as if it's some essential part of the state's offer. So you know, we're, we're not talking finances at this point. Uh, and, but if, if you have an economic climate where pretending this is all about finances serves the, uh, the PR for the state, well, that's the argument you're going to hear. If you're familiar with Naomi Klein, at all, shock. and the concepts of shock doctrine yeah. and disaster of capitalism. Um, you know that that's what's going on here. Um, you know everything is in cataclysm and crisis all the time. Therefore, you need to take hit for the team. When 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 has there never when has there ever not been a budget crisis? Right. <laughs> yeah, somewhere. Right. Or or a pending one, or a looming one, or a potential one. There's always a budget crisis right. somewhere. Right. It's always a budget crisis somewhere. And next time it's going to be us, and we have to be prepared for that. That's the sort of logic. <laughs> so, um, kind of getting back to uh, the issue about like graduation rates and uh, changes to the education structure, um, would it be fair to say that perhaps uh, the state or administration are being uh, somewhat short-sighted with all of this? I mean. Uh, is it possible that there could be a point at which people will look at public institutions and say, uh, you know, maybe like looking at the numbers, maybe this isn't for me. While it's certainly affordable, if I'm not going to be out of here in, you know, six years, how am I going to get that job that I thought, you know, going to college would get me? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap some context around that, so which gets back to your question. America has lost a lot of its middle class. The manufacturing sectors diminished, a lot of the middle class, classic middle class jobs that dwindled. And we're starting to split into a professional class and a service class. You don't need much of education for a service class. You have to have at least a bachelor's degree for the professional class. So it's becoming a social norm for everyone to go through college. So in a way, it's becoming the new high school. In 1950, your high school job, your high school education, could put you in the professional class, whereas now it wouldn't. Um, that's my understanding. I wasn't around in the 50s. That's my understanding. Right? So, <laughs> and you could also go back and look at the record. If I'm not mistaken, in the 1950s, something like seven percent of high school graduates went to college, whereas now it's closer to 50 percent of high school graduates directly. Yeah. Yes. Directly. In and so, you know, the higher education has swelled. Now, so that in and of itself impacts the quality of education. Um, and, and in the world of education, quality of education depends on, the quality of education depends on a large number of factors as far as I'm concerned. Um, the biggest one in my mind is always class size. You know, we, we know that the best education comes from one-on-one -on -one mentorship. So the closer you can get to one-to-one -one student to faculty ratio, <laughs> the better off you are. So that increasing class sizes is going to have an impact, at least in theory, have an impact on education. It's something we, as faculty, we've always tried to keep class sizes low. We're under constant pressure to increase class sizes, but fortunately we've reached the point where we can say, the rooms just aren't big enough. You can't make our classes bigger because all the seats are full. Which is and why we're them all online, because then there's limits. And until you can build new buildings 
or hire more faculty. We can't do it. Um, I think part, part like I don't know if like I'm uncomfortable with with short sighted as the as the description there. I think based on what I've read of the chancellors and and, and of people that are kind of in this camp with this vision, they I. And I hate to psychologize, right? To take this part of it with a with a grain of salt. Like I don't know what's really going on in their heads, but it seems like they really believe that students, as a kind of class nouns, you know, the class noun student, right, is more concerned about getting a degree as quickly as possible and less concerned about quality, and that we faculty are the sticks in the mud, right? We're the ones who refuse to modernize because we won't sacrifice this outdated, ivory tower, elitist conception of what quality means. And even though what all you really want is to get the hell out of here as fast as you can for as cheaply as possible. Right? I think they really believe that, that, that there's this paradigm clash between what we think higher education is supposed to be and what you think higher education is supposed to be, and they think they're on your side. Right? I, I, I really, really believe this. I, I would characterize that a little bit. My, my impression is that um, folks, who, folks uh, who manage the institution as a whole or manage passion as a whole, have this concept of what teaching and learning is. And it's a concept that's embedded in factual knowledge. The teacher comes into the classroom, tells you stuff, delivers factual knowledge, and you absorb it. And then later, you have a test in which you make sure that you've absorbed that factual knowledge. Right? Distance ed is a lot like this. I have my gripes about distance ed. It's very hard to make a distance education course that gets beyond the factual knowledge. It can be done. People who have done it. But that's not the common model. The common model is read this book, answer these questions. Oh, hey, if you actually have the book in front of you while you're answering the questions, you get all the answers right. right. That's not education. <laughs> but there's this model that essentially teachers are plug ins. We come into the classroom, we match particular curriculum, and you know, and then you, know, you pass these standardized tests and off you go. You know, it's and, and that's a horrible, horrible vision of education. Um, but I think it's a predominant vision of education. So I'm, I'm, and I'm concerned. I don't know that's what they're thinking, but I, I think that's the model we have in their heads. Because um, it takes me four hours to prepare a lecture. I have several lectures a week. I spend 40 hours a week preparing lectures <laughs> and exams. It takes me eight hours to create an exam. But if you look at the time budget from Apache, you know, in our, in our collective bargaining, the time budget is 90 minutes per lecture. You know, the, the thinking is that I can complete a lecture in 90 minutes, but the lecture itself is an hour long, and I can, get, I can construct an exam in 90 minutes, and I can create your exams in 90 minutes. If you, want, if, a week, if, you want, if you want to see what the Chancellor's vision of higher education looks like, I don't know if you can read my scrawl up here, Google this name. It's the U.S. Education Deliverology Institute. <laughs> oh, I wish. No, it sounds like no. It sounds like something out of Brave New World, right? Uh, and I can't remember. I got there's a, a British guy uh, who was uh, he was knighted not too long ago under like one of the conservative regimes. Uh, who he's like their like their education reform face delivery. Yep, deliverology. Deliverology. I'm not making this up, y'all. I'm not like I'm not I'm not crazy enough to make that up. Anyway, so. Oh, there it is. Hello there. Yeah. Oh no, it's the Liberology 101. It's the US EDI. I am not making this up, okay? So, like, yeah, Michael Barber, right? So, Michael Barber, right? So, this guy has developed this incredibly hyper rationalized scheme that he thinks like describes the most efficient and effective educational system. And our chancellor thinks this guy. I can't say that. I don't want to step on anybody's religious toes. He, he, like, 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 the, like the fact that this guy's been sainted is not high enough praise for the chancellor. And, and I'm underselling how great he thinks this guy is. <laughs> yeah, so for example, <laughs> with a writing emphasis course, with a writing emphasis course, writing emphasis course if, we to, if we want to teach a writing emphasis course, we have to keep the class size small. 
on the floor. It's a good uh, declining by degrees. It's a good frontline special on this, this issue, declining by degrees. That as you know, the class size gets large enough, and you're trying to teach a writing emphasis course, just as a faculty member, you just don't have the time. You know, if I was teaching four writing emphasis courses and I have 40 students per class, I'm looking at 160 essays. What am I going to do as a teacher? It's like uh, write one or two essays a semester. I'll look at one. I'll get to eat that one. one, one, one. <laughs> right, and all I can do is really check the grammar mistakes and yeah, take, take a point off for each of them. I can't because I don't actually have time to read them and think about the content. Yeah. In other words, they'll get graded like your high school papers did because that's what they were up against, right? The reason your high school English teachers never gave you any feedback on anything is because you had time. Well, that, that, that's the extent to which, I mean, I, I agree with what Seth said. That the, the way you phrased your question was certainly lead, right? I mean, but short-sighted to, to the extent that I, I endorse that term, right, I mean, that, that's what we're doing. We're playing kick the can with non-quantitative skills or skills that are hard to quantify. Um, I, I gave a presentation last week up at Cutstown and there were some Law faculty there and sitting around lunch. Right. Why, why, why are students worse writers than when we started teaching in law school? This was the topic of discussion. Well, I've, I've asked similar questions and I haven't been at a, a professor that long. Well, because you kick the can, because you want to quantify stuff and, and you want to measure you know, rates that can be easily, you know. And, and so, six year graduation rate. Yeah. Does that say anywhere, well, do you have the skills to succeed at your first job, right? Well, we, we just will assume so because you've got this credential, right? <laughs> but but you, 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 but now everybody has it. Right. So everybody's going to school. So. so so if everybody's got it, everybody must be qualified, right? I mean, yeah. just just thought experiment, right? I mean, yeah. if if whoever makes these decisions were, were to have to choose between a graduation rate that was you know two percentage points higher, or or, or maybe two percentage points lower, but students left with some quantum, I don't know what that would look like, because again, I've been arguing against this whole thing all along, but, but some quantum of skills that, that would uh, make them better prepared. I mean, what, what's going to get you? I mean, it's all about being able to report back numbers that can feed into you know, a ranking system, and then that ranking system itself will say, well, no, we're, we're not trying to drive schools to you know, toy with acceptance rates or, or mess with the yield numbers that are reported, but it's, yeah, it's all about numbers. It's all about making the best snapshot profile that you possibly can. And hopefully in the process, uh, quality of education isn't affected. Yeah. Hopefully it comes along for the ride. Right? I mean, I don't want to sound like a, a, being too fervent here, but right, I mean, so, and, and graduation rates, you, you can play with that too. I mean, Harvard deserves to be viewed as one of the elite schools in, in the world, of course, but any school that gets the entering Harvard freshman class is going to post a pretty awesome six year graduation rate. I mean, you know, and I, I hope I'm not sounding like I'm taking credit for this either. I, I freely admit, right? I mean, we, we have influence, I think, but the graduation, the, the, the single biggest determinant of our, our six year graduation rate is going to be the quality of you all that come in, right? I mean, you deserve most of the credit for this. And, and, and so, yeah, I mean, Harvard's is whatever number of students entered minus the ones that already started businesses, right? I mean, okay, sure, Harvard education's great, but those kids are gonna graduate from anywhere in four years. But I'll be damned if those kids, kids, I hate calling it, I'm sorry, I'm sorry up there. Um, I'll be, like, if the, if I don't mind, it makes me feel young. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you are young. Um, if those students, I, and, I, and I believe this with every fiber of my being, if those students are leaving Harvard after six years, having had better faculty and better learning experiences than you have, I've, I've never seen it or heard of it. I know an awful lot of students who have graduated from elite private schools, who have come to places like this to do master's degrees in my department, and who have said, what on earth did I spend $150,000 for? Right? Like, I just, like, I just don't buy it. I know people who graduated from the same PhD programs we did, who were teaching at places like that, and they couldn't give one half of a damn about their teaching responsibilities because they have to publish so much uh, and because they want to be researchers and they teach because their contract says they have to as opposed to people who come to this job where we teach because that's what we do, right? I mean, most of the people who are working here opted into the uh, teaching heavy job because that's what we do, right? That was a choice for most of us. 
Well, I think, and, and yeah, I mean, in some ways that's true. I mean, less for me than for you. Okay. Uh, it's different in the sciences than it is in the humanities in terms of the way that goes. But, um, you know, do, do you know what I mean? And, and, I, and, I, like that's a, and I, I really believe that. I do not think for a second, right? So in terms of extracurriculars, in terms of access to, you know, to, to, to technology and some of the toys, like in terms of the peripherals, sure, they can afford to do things we just can't. Touch on another thing, though. Student preparation for college is an important issue um, because we, you know, I encounter students all the time who are simply not ready for this experience. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to—I don't want to say you know they're they're not smart enough for college or they're you know or they don't have the right motivation to be in college. There's there's clearly a preparation issue, and we've been working, although it's difficult, to work with the high schools to say this is what we expect our students to know when they walk in. And we're trying to you know, go back and say, no, you can't kick the can up to college because it's not going to work. We're just going to fail those students who aren't prepared and can't do the work. Um, they're just going to fail, and it's kind of sad. I don't like it. I don't like it one bit. Because um, I would like all of my students to be prepared for this experience, walk in the door, and we're going to have a great time, and everyone succeeds. Um, there's a, clearly a preparation issue. Uh, and so we're, we're trying to feed back to the high schools and lower down to um, I'm getting away a little bit from all this scary, brave new world of education stuff. Um, how close are we to this? Are like if these contract negotiations that we're talking about are not, if we don't reach some kind of reasonable compromise, what would the consequences be for us? Well, our, our how close are we? No, how close? How no? I think you're asking how close are we to like to like deliverology? Yeah. Uh, like, uh, do you see your careers at Westchester encompassing any you know point at which you're going to be asked to teach students in this way? I won't do it. We all have. I think. I think. I think we all have our. I think we we, we probably have like somewhat different like like specific triggers that would make us make that decision. Um, were really clear about yours. Mine would be somewhat different. Uh, like my like my trigger to walk out the door would be the day we approved a contract that reduced salary for adjunct faculty while demanding you know without decreasing their workload. Uh, and and uh, you know like I'm a, I'm, a, I'm an adjunct faculty advocate. That's what I do almost full time outside of class. Right. That's like my second job now. And you know the, like the day the day that we approved a contract that like had the kind of inhumane horrific stuff that's been offered for that were proposed for them. I'm leaving. I will. I will. I will, I will and I like I, I believe that the, that the that the members of our union would never ever vote for a contract with that in it. Right. With any of that in it. Um, but if they did, I couldn't work with them. Anymore. And it's very, very difficult for me to, like, one of the reasons I haven't been to a board of governors meeting, uh, you know, even as an audience member, is because it's hard for me to be in a room with the chancellor if he would put his name on the proposals that say that. They're so inhumane. I just can't even believe that someone would even think of them. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <Yeah>. Thank you. <laughs> we get different, different faculty who have their different analysts. Yeah. yeah. But any, anyone who's seriously invested in and we, we, we do it because it's a passion of ours. We do it because we care. When the system degrades to a point that we're not educated, we're not doing the things we want to do, we're gone, we're done. Yeah. And you know, as, as I mentioned, the pendulum swings back and forth, and you know, it goes back the other way because teachers push on it. <laughs> you know, the teachers push on the pendulum and say, oh, they come back, we want our hours done. I think the direct answer to the question, how close are we, is like, not as close as it sounds tonight here in this room, right? I think. Do so, you think that going on strike would be effective enough to to prevent that? I think if you look at what the Chicago Teachers Union did at the beginning of the fall uh, when they struck, right? Their strike was about the K-12 versions of much thing. Like they weren't arguing about salary at all. That was all settled. Uh, but the media they, did a really good job of portraying it. That's right. Work, they, so. they, right. They said we're not arguing about money. They said like pay has nothing to do with this. We're arguing about a you know like a like a, a board of a board of education that's just making incredibly reckless decisions that will hurt our students, and we're not going to stand for it. Uh, and and and, and what we're doing.
doing right now. I think that like that's what a strike would be if that's what we have to do. If that would be on that same ground, right? The financial, at least in terms of salary, is like that's all done already. We're not talking about that anymore. Uh, you know, but we, yeah, we'll strike over educational quality. We're not going to sell the soul out of this place because of some like British guy's book that our chancellor just happens to think is great. Enough that he's paid tens of thousands of dollars to bring that guy to the United States to tour a couple of times. Sorry, I know I keep harping on that. It's been it's been it's been it's been a like a like a grade A irritant of mine since the first time I heard about this. A friend of mine who teaches at one of the Cal State campuses talked about this in a, a conference panel that I was on a couple of years ago. Uh, that was the first time I'd ever heard of deliverology. I thought she misspoke when she said it. Until she put the website up, and I said, "Holy mother of <laughs> insert PD here." Uh, I don't know who was what order. Um, what would you guys say is like are the main components of the main issues with high school education that are making it hard for students to succeed when they come to college? Do you think it's the testing component mainly, or what do you think that they're doing wrong? So I have to give an example. which just came up today. Um, I, I have students in my physics class who learned how to do addition and multiplication with calculators and learned all of their geometry with equations. So when I asked them on a test, you know, use Ampere's law to solve this problem, well, when you use Ampere's law, you have to know that the circumference of the circle is 2 pi r. Or if you use, uh, there are other rules, we have to know pi r squared. I assume my students know this. Soon they know the circle, and in fact, I believe very strongly that the students going into introductory physics should know these things cold. You know, they should be able to manipulate fractions cold. You know, know the so they can even challenge. substitute in like the variables with numbers. Oh no, 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 no they're okay with okay. it. So they can substitute variables into equations. Okay. It's that there, there's there are pieces of factual knowledge that they just don't know cold, uh, and it's a matter of rehearsal. So yeah. you know, when I was a kid. I reversed multiplication tables for months on end yeah. in elementary school. And when I was in geometry class, I had to know every geometric formula there was cold. I, you know. And so I think there's that and that degradation of the system uh, lower down. That's from my perspective. Is there anything like non mathematical scientific? I don't know. I would, would say, and I'm only sort of playing devil's advocate here, I graduated high school in 1986, and I would have failed. And I'm, I graduated from a very swanky prep school. And but these I are physics meters. These are physics meters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, frankly, I like I have a very different take on this than a lot of my colleagues do. I've been teaching college level writing classes. I taught my first college level writing class as a TA in my master's program in 1996. Right. So what, 16, 17 years now, however long that's been. That's how good I am at math. Uh, <laughs> right. It's been it, it, like like a decade and a half. Roughly, yeah. uh, I have not seen the degradation in skills that so many people like like decry and and, and, and wail over and moan over. Uh, I don't see any more comma slices per page now than I did in 1996. I don't see any more spelling than I did in 1996. I see much the same problems that I've seen, like you know, and there and there 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 are, like there are some things. The students now are so enculturated to being told exactly what to do and when to do it and how in terms of instruction that when asked to do something that doesn't that doesn't have an instruction that's very clear, it really freaks people out. Do you think right? that's the testing? I mean, you well, I think that I think that that's I think that's a, that's a bit of it. And there are two people in the room right now who did or are about to finish my writing 120 class, in which the major assignment for the course, I tell them when we start the semester, you're going to spend all semester begging me to tell you what to say in this paper, and I can't do it because it all depends on research that I haven't done. Right from the first day you learn anything about this project you're doing, you know a thousand times more about it than I do. And my right at that point to tell you what to think or how to think it is like it evaporates, <laughs> right? Um, and that's really creepy and spooky, I think. To especially like it's always been something that classes struggled with when I gave them that assignment. But I think that that feeling has gotten worse. I think that the kind of no child left alive has amplified that. <laughs> I see that in, in my students as well in the laboratory setting where you know, once 
you know, once the instructions get nebulous, students get a lot more lost and, and are much more, they're much faster at soliciting instruction. Like, help, we need help here. <laughs> Soon, but like, so I just wanted to wrap it up. I had uh, one more question, and I know all this. This is an incredibly interesting conversation, um, but I kind of want to bring it back to uh, your union. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could have another event on just you know the educational system overall. But um, I wanted to know, like, uh, you guys have the ability to strike. I mean, again, to relate to my father's union, they gave up the right to strike in the early, uh, early 70s for it, but they got instead binding arbitration. Right. Now, obviously there's some qualms about that within my father's union itself because they think a strike would be more, you know, pressing. Um, would you, and your, in your personal opinions, or the union's feeling overall, would you settle for binding arbitration uh, with trading, striking with binding arbitration? Or do you, would you prefer just being well, over strike? We actually we offered binding arbitration to the state. They oh. turned it down. I wouldn't, I, would, I wouldn't give it up legislatively, right? right? But we volunteered it. We okay. offered it to them. It, it was on the table. Absolutely. So, so it's not like, the assumption I get from a lot of, I've had, like my roommate is a very anti-union overall person. He's seen the detriments of certain unions. But, and I was trying to get him to this event. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, he's, He's incredibly bacchus about it, but um, it seems like when I get a notion from people who aren't as informed about this issue in particular, they either think it's about money or the fact that people are just want to have a strike. And I feel like you both address that. And yeah, it's, it's not like every four years we put on exactly. like strike costumes and, I, and have some celebrations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how many, never struck. Yeah, how many times has it happened here? In Cashy? Yeah. Zero. Never struck. No, co no individual college, no nothing. Oh, no, no, no. We're We've all gone almost 18 months without a contract. If, if that doesn't testify enough to how little we want to go on strike in, in the whole, right? which is why I kind of it's something that. that's <laughs> necessary if it becomes necessary. But it's absolutely a last resort. Uh, we offered binding arbitration to stay. I wanted to get out of the house. Turn it down. Yeah. And they're, they're, you can't force them to the table. Look, I'm the offer of arbitration, so. Right, and, and, the, and the, you know, they just want to strike argument. I'm sorry, I do a great deal of activist work, a variety of kinds, like labor activism and peace activism and environmental activism, like blah, blah, blah. And if my colleagues were 1 50th as radical as your roommate seems to think we are, my life would be a lot easier, <laughs> right? In terms of trying to get people to do things that I wish they would do. I wish we were the troublemakers that people like that think we are, uh, you know, and, and we're not. Most of us. <laughs> and most of us who are stick out like sore thumbs. <laughs> Strange as it is, a bunch of people with PhDs are actually rational, kind right. of people. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Never. Thanks for all showing up. No. Yeah, thanks for coming out, Kelly. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for being part of our event. And, uh, I think everybody's learned a lot, and I certainly enjoyed this. So thank you all very much. And